Welcome to the Mid-South 2024. this event is so popular has got to be because of this guy right here Bobby Wintle full stoke this guy is above and beyond you don't come to the Mid-South and not get hugged by Bobby So because there's so many people at the start line, and I'm not a big fan of getting there an hour early, I mean, some of those doofuses were there with their rollers on the front roll. Hey, that's a little over the top for me. I like to show them five, ten minutes before the start because I think sitting there with all that anxiety is just not good. So I opted to get there a little later, which meant I started a little further back, which also meant I had to make some moves to try to get to the front. So here you'll see I put in not really that hard of an effort just swing out wide and I go from the back to the front real quick I want to point out right here at the onset that my race time was about four and a half hours and my normalized power was the highest that I've ever seen 316 which for me is an 88 percent intensity factor and my average heart rate was 170 the reason I want to point this out right at the onset of the race is for you to be thinking throughout the race, why was Drew's normalized power so high? And it could be because I'm just not that arrow. In fact, when me and Dylan looked at our power numbers comparatively, he was about 10 watts less than mine and he finished a lot better than me. He was fifth, I was 11th on the day. I know that's a spoiler. But in the grand scheme of things, why is my normalized so much higher than his if we weigh the same amount, our bikes are comparatively the same weight? It has to be aerodynamics or it could be other factors. For example, if you'll notice, I leave a lot of gaps behind people because in the last three races that I've done, I've crashed. And so I went into the Mid-South wanting to not crash. And so that meant I wasn't very trustworthy of the wheel in front of me. And so anytime there was a sketchy road, I would tend to let the gap open so that I could have a more visual, more eyes on the road and be the, uh, the dictator of my own fate. I didn't want to, to crash because of somebody else. About 12 miles in, there's a creek crossing, so everybody right now is pinning it to get to that creek crossing, and there's a couple tricky ruts, and as you'll notice, two guys are about to bite the deck. Oof. All right, let's watch that again. I don't think that the second crash was caused by the first. I think both of these riders just made the same mistake of getting stuck in that rut, and they both just so happened to crash right on top of each other. All right, so a lot is about to happen here. Payson is about to go into the water right in front of me. He's the first person to do so. It is a good move. He goes from about 20th place to fifth place. But right to his right, there's this guy in white and he remounts his bike right there. 
and he is about to, again, fight the deck. He touches Pete's wheel. Pete, good job, didn't crash, but this guy, he's straddling the top tube, and bada bing, bada boom, he is in the mud. Everybody else is off their bikes. I'm just stuck in the chaos thinking and wishing, man, I should have followed Payson through that creek because now Payson is already up the hill and I'm still off my bike trying to get on it. To my left, you can see Ted King. I really want to point out how bad of a stutter step he has. Yep, that was just horrible. Come on, dude. Do some cyclocross. Uh, you can just see all the, the, the aftermath, the chaos, passing guys. Just from not going through the creek and riding that grassy line, of course, I'm on road shoes, and so one of my thinking was I really don't want my shoes to get clogged up with mud, and so I went with the dry line. But just this effort to catch back on was about, I think my heart rate was at least elevated for about 20 minutes, and I and a normalized power of 362 watts, which is basically my threshold for 20 minutes. It's pretty early in the race. I don't think that full 20 minutes was us chasing, uh, but my heart rate was pretty high for a 20 minute period. All right, so there is two riders off the front, Chase Wark and another guy, I'm not quite sure who that is, maybe Ryan Standish. And I get into a little bit of a conversation with Payson McKelvin as these two riders are off the front. I'm sitting about fourth wheel, Payson is about fifth wheel, and Payson barks up to the top couple guys, who I don't know who they are, and says, come on guys, we can pull them back. And what he's trying to do is get those guys to work harder to pull back these two riders, which he apparently thought was a threat. Now, I immediately responded and said, you don't have to listen to him because you don't have to. Just because somebody who's won this race before yells at you to go harder does not mean you have to listen. You have a decision at every point in the race to go harder or not go harder. And that is tactics, my friends. If I don't want to pull, I don't have to. If these two guys off the front, yeah, they might not be my teammates, but in this case, I could treat them like teammates and say, you know what, I don't mind them being off the front. In fact, I would rather you, Payson, pull them back than me because I know you're stronger than I am. And he even responded to me and said, hey man, if you want to be in the Lifetime Series, you got to be strong. And I said, dude, I'm never going to beat you off of strength. The only way I'm going to beat you is if I'm using my brain. And to me, that means doing less work than him so that I have some kind of an edge on him at the end of the race. Now here we're about 40 miles in. They called this section Narnia and you can see I'm on the front of the group. We've caught those two riders, it's all back together. And this section was a pretty important section. I wanted to lead going into it. I did get, I did get passed by a few riders, but I go into this tricky technical section of where I want to be. I'm, I'm kind of in that top five-ish positioning. Um, and I, and I and I'm happy with that. Uh, one of the things that I do point out is like, there's certain riders that you know who aren't super technical. And to me, one of those riders in the past has been Pete Stetton. And you can see he's two spots ahead of me. So that is one person where I'm like, okay, I'd rather not go into technical sections behind Stetna. Um, however, this section's not too bad and he really holds his own. He does a good job going through this section.
though the group gets a little split up at this point, but we've caught those two riders. It's probably a group of 20, 25 with a few people chasing behind us. Dylan actually was caught off guard with that section. That was like one of the one parts of the course that he didn't pre-ride. So he's actually in the chase group of a few riders behind us that you'll see pop out here in a second. About at the midway point, we hit the stop, the aid, and we've got a friend of ours, Tyler Cloutier, a fellow Bonk Bros, in the aid with us. Now, a few things I want to point out here. Uh, obviously, I'll walk you through my nutrition plan. I'm on the flow formulas. I started the race having four bottles. I only got through three of those bottles. I had a little bit of fluids left in each of those bottles, and then I went through a flow gel mix. 480 carbs total, which was just over 100 carbs per hour, which is pretty standard for me. One thing I really want to point out is Dylan went into the feed zone ahead of me. I went to the back of the group because I thought we were going to try to gap each other so that we didn't overwhelm Tyler. But Dylan's stopping here, taking off his arrow boot covers. And I just want to say, how arrow, how, how much, how much seconds do you think those arrow shoe covers saved him versus cost him when he just spent 20 seconds trying to take those things off? I thought for sure I was never going to see Dylan again. I thought that was the end of his race. I'm like, what is he doing? I only stopped for less than 10 seconds, and I had to chase for about four minutes at, at like 400 watts to catch back up. Um, so it was definitely not an easy effort, and I only stopped for 10 seconds. Now, here's another section, really important part of the race. Uh, there were these really sandy sections, and again, I'm caught off guard. I'm at the back of the group through this section with the Australian Gravel National Champ, and uh, we're just slowly getting gapped from the main group. Ultimately, we have to put in a pretty big effort to catch back on. Um, it was definitely not a small gap. Ends up being about a 20-minute effort, 8 miles and about a 350 normalized power. I don't know if, if that was the whole time we were off the back, but there was at least a 20 minute period where again, my heart rate was pretty elevated and this was a part of that effort. Now we've caught back up. I find Pace and McElveen's wheel, and I'm like, all right, I cannot get stuck at the back of this group once again. And so me and Payson roll to the front of the group where it's just safer to be there. It's better to be at the front so that when things like that happen, you're not caught off guard and gapped off the back. And so I try to position a little bit better going into these few upcoming sections. The group is not dwindling as quick as I thought. There's still about 20 to 30 strong riders, and I'm looking around thinking, it's gonna be really hard to even get top 10, top 20 looking at the riders that are in this group. So I'm not, not the, the, the self-talk is not very confident right now. I'm hurting, I'm spending a lot of time at the back of the group. Surprisingly, Payson is at the uh, back of the group with me. Um, in fact, in his video, he pointed out three times that I was trying to be sly or clever by not pulling. And again, it just shows you the tactics or the lack of tactics that these guys uh, understand. Um, Drew Dillman was also in this group, although we don't really see him because he was cleverly very parked at the back. I honestly completely forgot about him. There's just uh, Drew Dillman. Haven't seen him for a while. Shout out to him for a strong ride. He definitely uh, was playing his cards well hiding as much as he could. You'll see in a minute, I, I bark at him a little bit for opening a gap and Drew Dillman's not pulling through. So now it's just kind of four, four on two. Obviously Payson's won this race three or four times at this point. If I do the same amount of work as Payson, 
by the end of this race, who do you think is going to win? Probably Payson. And so I am ultimately thinking I need to do less work than these guys because they're probably stronger than me. So again, it just goes to tactics. Uh, he can... I don't care what Payson says or anybody says. If they want me to pull harder, I don't have to listen to them. That is ultimately my choice, 100% my choice. So uh, I, I kind of get frustrated sometimes when those guys are like, come on, dude, pull harder, and yeah, because I don't have to. I would even say that it would be not so smart for me to pull through or to pull harder. Now here we come up on a vital part of the course. We're about 10, 12 miles from the finish and Payson and Russell Finsterwald cut, you could say cut the course. They take a shortcut. They cut through the grass and they go from next to me to top five. And I go into this dirt section maybe about 15th place, 10th to 15th place. And they go into it like third and fourth and they come out of it at the front of the group. Now I wanna argue that them cutting that through that grass gave them that advantage, whereas the rest of us stayed on the pavement and took the turn like normal people. And of course, in his video, he says he has race brain, but it's still like, come on, dude. Uh, you've done a lot of races. You can't just blame it on race brain. This is a vital part of the course, and doing that gave you a huge advantage. Now we pop out onto the road section. There's a little bit of a gap. Dylan wants me to pull through. Hey, buddy. I know even me and you are friends. And I want, yeah, I, I do want to help you. But again, tactics, man. I, it is kind of tactics. It's also that I was dying. Uh, I was definitely on my edge right here. In fact, I, I get popped not too long after this from this lead group. Um, and so, yeah, for the six minutes after the single track section to catch up to those lead groups was uh, a normalized power of 375 for six minutes. It all comes back together. There's eight of us all together in the lead group now at this point. And this is right when Toby and Griffin Easter attack and get a little bit of a gap. And now we're chasing. Um, again, Payson calls me out once again for not pulling through. At this point, it's not so much that I didn't want to pull through to save energy. At this point, it was more so I was dying and on the edge and barely hanging on. Looking around at the other guys in this group, you've got Russell Finsterwald, big time mountain biker. Uh, you've got multiple ex world tour riders. And I would say, and I'm pretty sure everybody else in this group would agree that I was the weakest rider. So I'm going to do everything I can to save energy, to try to stay in this group for as long as possible. But ultimately I do come a little unhitched and I'm off the back of this group chasing solo to the finish. The lead car comes up and asks me a question, uh, and then about a minute later, we hit this really busy intersection, and they don't stop the traffic, which is a little frustrating. That cost me probably 10 seconds to have to stop and wait for cars to go by. They had literally just passed me, so they could have stopped traffic for me as well. A little bummed about that. Um, so rolling into town, I'm in eighth place, chasing really hard to not get caught. There's three guys, I can see them behind me about 10 seconds. I make somewhat of a little wrong turn. Uh, the last turn to the finish is the left-hand turn, and my Garmin, I just looked down and saw on the map the left turn, 
And so I started to turn left, but I actually turned left onto the road before the correct road. So those three guys buzzed past me. If I hadn't made that wrong turn, I'm pretty confident I could have held them off. That would have been an eighth place finish. I end up 11th on the day. For the last 30 minutes of the race, so basically from the single track to the finish, we've got a normalized power of 338, so definitely not an easy effort. That was the most important part of the race for those 30 minutes. And again, looking at the overall results, I'm less than a minute and a half behind the winner of the race. I'm only 10 seconds off from Brennan Wirtz, who was, who was eighth, which if I had not made that wrong turn, I think I could have been that. It would have put me on the podium for the 20 to 29 age group, which would have been sweet. But, you know, you live and you learn. I should have pre-rode that final section to see what that last turn looked like and should have known it ahead of time. That's my mistake. 